Welcome to the Northeast Kingdom Voice. I'm your host, Scott Wheeler. Today's topic is heroin addiction and heroin recovery. Today, our guests are people who know all too well about addiction. I will let them introduce themselves. Pastor Wall. I'm Pastor Larry Wall from the Church of God on the Crawford Road in Derby. I have struggled with addiction in my younger years and uh, serve in a church that is uh, dedicated to those uh, that are struggling with those kinds of things and uh, we offer a lot of help and it's good to be here to get the message out that there is hope. Jill's Gently, I'm the Director of Admissions for Teen Challenge Vermont. Um, I raised a Newport boy, um, was a drug addict for many years, struggled with heroin addiction and went into the program of Teen Challenge and I'm here now to, because our mission is to reach every addict with the message of hope um, that there is freedom. I'm Melissa Zabrowski. Um, I'm the sister to um, Eric Morin, who passed away on Christmas Eve from a heroin overdose. Um, I'm here today and because my mission is to show this community there is hope and to change this around and be here for those that need us. I'm Jeanette Birch. I'm the mother of Gary who died uh, the day after Easter of an overdose. And so my goal today is to raise awareness um, and show people that there is hope and to not be afraid to remove the stigma of being embarrassed or ashamed of any of this. and show people that there's help out there. Right. Well, I want to commend all four of you for being here, but I particularly want to commend you, you and Missy uh, because, you know, this must be the worst thing, especially you, any parent's worst nightmare. Uh, did you two want to, did you want to mention who your brother was and what he was all about? Uh, my brother, um, Eric Morin, he was 35 and big tall guy and huggable and likable and just a really good man who was always there for anyone that wanted him, wanted him needed his help um, never thought anybody would hurt him and was extremely trusting of everybody um, I miss him dearly are you able to talk about your son? Um, yeah, my son Gary was very likable as well. Loved, loved life. Loved to have fun. Had lots and lots of friends. Um, would give you the shirt off his back, for sure. He just would do anything for anyone. Now, let's go. Uh, did, did their stories sound you know, very similar to yours? Like, were you... I'm a likable guy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, so you could be, you, you could have been her brother, you could have been her son, if, yeah. if something, what happened? Um, wow, good question. I, I just, um, I got fed up with, with the addiction. Um, it cost me way too much and I lost my home, I lost my family. And um, I reached out to to a local pastor. I was actually supposed to meet with Pastor Wall, but uh, I ended up being too wasted in, in a field. And it's a bad story. But anyway, um, and they, they told me about Teen Challenge. And so I went down and checked it out. And uh, uh, the program changed my life. I only, I only went in on a 30-day plan because I just wanted to get get clean so I could get high again and um, it changed my life how does this is one question I'm, I've even contemplated myself uh, but I, I see a lot of people trying to mull this topic over most of them are very respectful 
How does somebody get involved with something that's, especially now, so deadly? As you know, because the heroin of the '60s and the heroin of today is different. How did you get involved with drugs? There's a, there's a few things. Um, one, nothing else is getting you high, so you have to go to the next level. Um, two, it's I call it mental simulation. It's it's basically believing that it can't happen to me. It can happen to you, and it can happen to your son. But I'll never overdose, and I'll never become addicted. So yeah, the rules apply to everyone but me. Um, and, and that's how we get into the addiction is because we don't believe that the rules apply to us. How long have you been clean for? Ten years. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, and so you didn't just become clean. This seems to be a mission for you. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I just want to let people know that there's hope and that there's help and that they don't have to stay in addiction. And does, uh, I assume Teen Challenge has a number that... Uh... 802-635-7807. Okay, Pastor Wall, you are very well known in the area as a rather flamboyant, very uh, <laughs> adept speaker who, when you, when you speak at your congregation, you can speak to... I think there's not a person in your congregation that does not think you're talking about them, as in you have a way. And, but I, I, I feel, I think a lot of people are gonna be surprised who maybe don't know you real well. You were not always that person. Tell us a little bit about yourself in a previous chapter of your life. Well, there, there were two, two journeys. One was with, uh, with the drugs, and that started early. Um, I had a, a a lot of turmoil in my relationship with my dad and uh, this started when I was about 11 where, where it really started to, to get bad and I was very insecure and, and uh, just uh, you know didn't feel like I fit in anywhere and uh, the cool kids at my school were the ones that were you know smoking marijuana and doing those things so so I found a group of people where I felt accepted and of course, the more I engaged in that, the deeper it went, and, and uh, to the point where I started to use heroin. I didn't. Uh, it was about a six-month period where I, where I was uh, injecting heroin intravenously, and then my father found a set of what we call works and and uh, confronted me with that, and they they committed me to a mental institution in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. And I was there for a while, and. And uh, from there, I moved to Vermont where my uncle took me in and my cousin gave me a job and I stayed clean for a while and then turned 18. And when I turned 18, I discovered another drug called alcohol and that was a whole nother journey. And uh, so I've had trouble with all of those kinds of things. And uh, the alcohol took me to the place where uh, my wife and three children left me, never to be seen again. She's from England, and she left, and I'll never forget the day that she uh, confronted me. She said, you know, I, I can live with you because I love you, but I refuse to live with that, as she pointed to the bottle. And I was so sick that I said, if you don't like it, there's the door. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't think she could take the door. We had no money, but there was a family that she had worked for as a nanny that knew what was going on and told her, if you ever want to leave, we'll, we'll buy you passage to, for you and the girls to go back to England. Anyway, after that took place, I realized what was going on, and I, I got what I call today the gift of desperation, and uh, called uh, uh, a fellow who was in a 12-step program, and, and the rest is history. And I've been so was this before you were a minister? Or? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you, you know, not saying you're old pastor, but but you you do you do come from a different generation yes. than uh, what her brother or her son or yeah. even Jill's here. Uh, what was what was it like trying to recover? You know, heroin addiction then and trying to recover versus now. Well, uh, again, I was put in a, in an institution. Uh, you know, it 
was uh, a, a mental hospital, actually. I was in a hall where they had uh, schizophrenics, catatonics, drug addicts. You know, I was in that kind of a mix. Uh, but, but, you know, I was just thinking about that the other day that, uh, you know, we were, you know, I come from well-to-do family. My dad was a vice president of a, a bank down in Puerto Rico, and, and the friends that I was hanging out with were from good families. And, and here we were, you know, shooting dope. Um, so it, it has no, uh, you know, the drug doesn't, doesn't discriminate, you know, it'll, it'll attack wherever and whoever. Um, uh, I don't think it's, it's, uh, it's always been a problem, you know, in different pockets. Here in the state of Vermont, it has just started to intensify, but, uh, where I was born and raised in Puerto Rico, it was all over. It was rampant. Uh, but the difference is you didn't hear about these uh, deadly strains of heroin. That, that you, didn't, you didn't hear about too much. You know, Jills, was, uh, when you, you said you've been clean for, for 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, even in that, that 10 years, things have even changed about absolutely how did what what was teen challenges strategy to helping you become clean <laughs> so so teen challenge is a faith-based program so so there's a spiritual component um, but it's 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 beyond just the the, the faith of it um, and it will confront the character flaws that that has um, one of the the great things about Teen Challenge is that everybody who works for the program has been through the program, so we're all addicts. Um, so so you can't hustle and, and jive your way through the program because we'll spot it fast, um, and we're able to confront character flaws and and things that that the addicts tend to do, like lying and manipulating. So so we address the behavioral issues as well and and hopefully um, you're able to get to the to the root of the problem because addiction is is kind of like an iceberg you see only the outside of it so so you see the the addiction um, and you see the behaviors because of it but when you get under the surface it's much deeper and there's a reason that somebody is putting a needle in their arm and so that's what needs to be addressed and I think that's the problem that I have with with things like methadone and buprenorphine is you're not getting to the root of the problem, you're you're just covering the the surface issues. Now here's here's one uh, thing I because I, I I have never been an addict. You know, uh, you know the only closest thing I am is to coffee. You know, uh, in other words, it's not a big issue. Is so I have not lived, I have not lived it. So so mine is more just. From having friends, acquaintances, uh, and I, I seem to be a sounding board for a lot of people. Uh, but some people say so, some some people, whether they're addicts or helping in the recovery process, they said the only redeeming thing is sometimes that you know methadone or buprenorphine at least helps them clear their head up enough so they can start forward. But I can tell you. I, I have acquaintance who said that buprenorphine was the worst thing they ever had to withdraw from, and uh, that you know that they they just said that was a lot worse than uh, a lot worse than heroin. It, yeah, methadone is was one of the worst things to come off of. It takes a whole lot longer than I'd rather kick dope than methadone. Right. So you know, but then I see. I even see, you know, that once an addict, you're always an addict. Uh, that you, that you will never uh, yeah, rewires your brain. You need this stuff. Is I see you shaking your head, Pastor. No, Paul. what do you? No. You know, uh, we all have different opinions and different outlooks on on this. Uh, um, for me, uh, the addiction is a symptom mm -hmm. of a deeper problem. And the problem is not having the ability or the know-how or whatever to, to cope with life, you know, to deal with the issues of life. So instead of facing life and facing the challenges, you run from it. 
And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not against using something to help someone taper off, but, you know, just for a temporary solution, because what needs to happen is that person needs counsel, needs to be given resources, spiritual, emotional, mental resources as to how they're going to deal with life, with the daily challenges of life. In, and the, in the case of Eric, I mean, that's exactly true because Eric had, when my parents divorced, Eric became the man of the house at a very young age. And um, sadly, my dad wasn't always there. Um, and so he felt as he got older, when he got into high school, that he wanted to be accepted. And Eric was shy and quiet, but when he got into high school was when things started to change for him. And I think it was because he found a crowd that he felt accepted. But he also had all these internal things as he grew older that he had to deal with. He became a father at 17. Um, our parents, you know, had divorced, and, and that was, you know, in and itself, struggle, he had to struggle with that. He, had, he was insecure. Um, he had anxiety. He had depression. He had all these things that he didn't deal with that he coped through drugs and alcohol. It began with alcohol and then led to drugs, uh, to not to drugs, but to um, pills, cocaine, um, and eventually heroin. And like Pastor Wall said, it's methadone and suboxone, I truly believe it should be a uh, short-term solution, right. but it's the deeper issue that yeah. needs to be addressed. Yeah, because uh, that's what, um, you know what some um, addicts tell me, and I think they've even been on my show, is because when, when you start cleaning up, they were saying, you know, you know when, you, when you start detoxing, whether you're on methadone or whether you're cold turkey in it, is you then have to face what you were running from. That's right. Is, yes. And they said that sometimes that's enough to put you right back on Absolutely. me. Absolutely. Because, and then, um, then some, of the, uh, some of them have said because you not only then are you running, not only do you have to face the reason you got involved in drugs, but sometimes, you know, particularly with women, if they sold their bodies during, uh, to get their drugs, they then have to face that kind of sure. uh, fact. So, so coming clean, they were saying, and that's how come they were, they were saying that sometimes, the, uh, and, and by the way, I, I don't pretend to be an expert, and no way am I, but I'm only going from the people I've spoken to, is that it's a real danger period too once a person starts coming out of it because all of a sudden you're just like you're having all this stuff come at you that you kind of like buried away yeah well scott the uh you know a a trait of, a, of an addict and alcoholic is to isolate right mm -hmm. and uh what they taught me at the beginning is don't do that and here's some phone numbers I had a bunch of phone numbers given to me, and if you ever get the desire or whatever, just pick up the phone. And these were people that had been there, so I could, I could trust them. But, uh, you know, basically with me it was I had to admit that my life had become unmanageable. And I had to, I had to realize that there was no way that I could do this, because to be honest with you, I had tried. You know, a lot of people don't understand. They say, well, why don't they just stop? You know, they had a little willpower, you know, they, they could stop. Well, I tried everything, you know, and I made so many promises to my wife, to myself, you know, and I talked to myself and I said, you dummy, you know, uh, I'll never do this again. That's and right. I find myself doing it again yeah. and again and again. So I tried everything in my power and I couldn't do it and then realized that I needed a power greater than myself to, to help me through this. But then there came a time in the process where I had to look inwardly and really see what was happening on the inside and then be willing to admit and share what was happening on the inside with God and another human being that I could trust. And it wasn't until that happened where I started to deal with the guilt and deal with the shame. So that's what where the trouble is. When we start to look at stuff, then the guilt and the shame comes sure. on and we want to run. 
but uh, you know, the help that I got, there was no judgment, there was no condemnation, there was understanding. And, uh, you know, because I got plenty of this. You know, you need to straighten your life up, you need to. And, uh, but when I went to these people uh, that understood, it, it started to make sense. But I had to take an inward look, you know, take a moral inventory of myself, and then be willing to go through the process of change. And that's, that's not easy to do for, because as an addict or an alcoholic, I'm, I'm an egomaniac with an inferiority complex. And I'm self-centered to the extreme, you know. And those are issues that are, you know, pertinent to the inward person, so. So Janet, what was your son's struggle like? Because he, he, he tried. To, to, reco uh, to, to recover. He wanted to stop on his own. You know, it started with alcohol in high school and, and marijuana, but there was a lot of drinking that went on for a lot of years. Um, and a year ago in March, he had back surgery. And um, for sure, those pills were being abused. And I believe that, even though he didn't tell me this, I believe that when he couldn't get those pills anymore that he was introduced to heroin. And he did say, I have no pain when I use this. Um, I don't believe that he wanted to be an addict. He actually did say, it's not like I woke up one day and wanted to be an addict. Um, but last summer, we would see less and less of him. Um, he'd come around when he wanted something, sometimes coming for dinner, but it was different friends every weekend. It wasn't the same old friends anymore, um, but really avoiding us, and we could never get into any deep conversations. It was all very superficial. Um, there was lying. Um, Though he didn't steal from us, um, we were warned that that was a strong possibility, and so we did have to not just lock our home, but lock rooms in our home. Um, and then he lost his job. Um, his boss was very kind and compassionate and was willing to work with us to help him get help, and he admitted that he had a problem. Um, but he wasn't willing to get help. He said he could do it on his own. He, he was willing to meet with a counselor and he, he did that a little bit, but then he found a new job and worked a lot of hours so he didn't meet with him regularly. And then when that um, seasonal job ended, he went back to Ohio um, where a lot of this began. Um, against our will, we told him it wasn't a good idea, um, but he felt that's what he wanted to do and needed to do. Um, again, very superficial conversations on the phone. Um, when we saw him at Christmas time, he had lost a lot of weight. And I approached him about it and told him I was worried about that. But he Denied it was a problem, said he felt really good, um, but we knew something wasn't right. And that must be a, that must be just a horrible feeling for a parent to know something's wrong, but you. And I didn't know. I don't know what I didn't know what to do. You know, it's all new to me. I I didn't know how to do this. You know, we tried to maintain that relationship with him because we didn't want to push him away. But yet we didn't really know how to help him either. What is the last thing, a you know? What's the last thing you do do to a, you know? You were saying you didn't want to push him the right way. That that to me, I think, is a is the first thing you don't want to do is push them away. You're on your own. Isn't that is that correct? You don't want to push these people away. I was told from a counselor that I've seen um, that loving them is the best thing you can give them. Yeah. 
and sometimes I would distance myself because I, I had to, but I would try to do things in a loving way. And this last time, um, Eric quit on his own and it was two or three weeks of just pure agony of him being ill at, at my mom's house. And then my, he did, he, like Gary, wanted to do it on his own. And um, I was trying to be there for him every single day. We would talk, and he would come over and do things with me if he could. And um, I was trying to get him counselors and people to convince him to go see somebody. Convincing him to go even just talk to somebody was challenging. But there's a lot of resources out there that I don't think people even know about. And... I didn't know about Teen Challenge until Jenette and I, after everything happened in our families, ha um, until that time. And I wish that I would have known because Jill's knew Eric. Mm -hmm. And I truly think he could have made a huge difference because Eric would have been able to relate to him. And I think some of the resources that are out there aren't as exposed as they should be because there is such stigma in in this community in this area or on this topic right. in general and, and but you, you you struck on to something too is about you didn't know the resources and I, and I I think sometimes these agencies and everything you know especially state agencies and such I think they need to do more about educating people about what they do offer because I have my degree in psychology and I'm still, you know, uh, in different chapters of my life I've used it, but um, I'm still learning what this area has to offer and what it doesn't have to offer. Here's a question is, how, how are we set right now with people who handle people with addiction issues? Do, are, do we have enough people or is that, are we, we're not. Well, uh, <clears throat> you know, I deal with uh, alcoholics and drug addicts by opening our church up to 12-step groups. Right. And we have uh, four meetings. Right. Uh, no, five, actually. We have four AA meetings and one NA meeting. Um, I don't know of any other church that has that many. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but that's because of my background. How can, how can somebody contact your church to find out? Well, there's an AA hotline. Okay. That's in the yellow pages. That's, uh, you know, problems okay. with alcohol, you call it AA. And, uh, you know, that's, that's one way. The, the reason that, that uh, I'm so supportive of it, not only did I go through, through it, but it was through AA that uh, that I came to a relationship with God and, and fulfilled, you know, was called to ministry. There, there are two things that that uh, struck me at the beginning, and uh, and I understand the American Medical Association has declared alcoholism and addiction to be a disease, but it's a, a it's it's it affects you spiritually, mentally, and emotionally. And there's a line in how it works which is in the big book of AA, that says, remember that we deal with alcohol or drugs, however way you want to put it. Cunning, baffling, powerful. Without help, it is too much for us. But there is one who has all power. That one is God. May you find him now. That's the way it's worded. And uh, now it's true that many don't, don't take that line they just come to the meetings and 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 stay i call it dry uh but i took that literally it, it didn't say find him tomorrow or find him next week it said may you find him now and then uh, at the conclusion it says our experiences make clear three pertinent ideas a that we are alcoholic and could not manage our own lives which was true b that no human power could have relieved our alcoholism and see that God could and would if he were sought. And so that's where my journey in seeking be began, and I'm still seeking. But for me, it was uh, 
an experience with God that, that brought me to where I am. Because when my wife left me, and I was alone in that house, and I thought I really was going to start living, I had plans, but reality came, and, and I looked up at the ceiling, and I said, if you're real, you've got to help me get out of this mess. And, and I'd prayed a lot of prayers before Scott, you know, after drinking, you know, till 3 o'clock in the morning and trying to get home, and I'd say, Lord, if you help me to get home just this one more time, I'll never do this again. <laughs> but uh, but that was a sincere prayer, and I felt the presence of God and got the courage to go to the phone, pick up the phone, and say, I think I, I, think I have a drinking problem. I need help. And it was 20 below zero that that early morning and that fellow got out of his bed and came to my house I tried to set up an appointment and he said no I'll be right over I'll be right over he shared part of his story and and uh, the rest is history but but you probably struggled still though didn't you or was it just all of a sudden? it was lifted it was completely lifted I had no more desire to drink now I struggled with with uh, different things I mean I was sober I think it was two months, and I get a call. I'm on the job, and I get a call from my boss's wife that my house was on fire. You know, and they kept saying in the meetings, things are going to get better, things are going to get better, near my house burns down. But I had learned a prayer known as the serenity prayer, and when I approached that house that was burning down, I said, Lord, I don't have time for this. i got to get sober. Uh, would you please take care of this? And I prayed the serenity prayer to accept what I can't change and change what I can. And what happened there was that uh, I called my wife, Sally. I never asked my wife to come back, nothing like that, because I didn't deserve that. But told her what had happened. You know, the house burned down. Fortunately, she had taken her valuables and put them in storage somewhere. And uh, she detected a change in the way I was dealing with that crisis in my life. Well, she detected, he said, he's, and then she suggested, well, let's try working things out again. And it's a long story, but, but I said all of that to say this, I, I, I like the, the, for me, it's the spiritual, because I'm a pastor, I mean, you know, it's obvious that for me, it's helping people to find a relationship with God and, and since it's worded like that, you know, I can, I can back my belief up. You know, there's one who has all power, that one is God, may you find him now. Now, that's not to say, don't, don't misunderstand, that there are people that can uh, stay away from drugs uh, by just coming and going through the process, but they, they still stay kind of miserable. They don't have the peace and they don't have the, the joy of living. That's been my observation. But anyway. You know, yeah. uh, one thing I, I hear a lot of people say, especially the people who are not addicts, is I understand the concept of a disease I, I, in addiction. But to me, maybe the addiction itself might be a disease. But is your desire to have heroin? You know, I, I, I think sometimes people use it as a, I hate to say it, a crutch. Like I have a disease. So I'm not, I, I am not in control. What do you, what do either I was, you mean? I was just quoting the American Medical Association has deemed that alcoholism is a disease. That's, yeah. that's what I'm yeah, but just what I'm quoting that. No, but what I'm saying now is I hear it often. Well, I'm, I'm not in control. I have a disease. But is, what I'm saying is, does, are we predispositioned to drink alcohol or to shoot heroin or is the once you're addicted is that the disease where does the d disease of heroin abuse come in it's a thinking problem it's the way that we think it's the way that we deal with life and so for for an addict you know at least for me you know a drink and to leave the drink once i get started there's there's something that starts to take place but if I go to the first drink, it isn't like all of a sudden I, you know, I've been thinking about this thing and I've been planning for it and I've been, you know, so it all happens, you know, it, is, it isn't just by accident. But, uh, what do you think about this? It's an interesting question. Um, I come from a, from a long line of drinkers and, and my family is 
it runs rampant with addiction and alcoholism. I knew that I was predispositioned to this. I, b I believe that, that, that it's, it's part of my family DNA or whatever. Um, and so I knew when I started drinking and, and stealing my uncle's beers when I was just a kid that, that I was headed for the same path that they were. Um, and I did use it as a crutch. I, I would I'd use anything as a crutch. I mean, find, you know, my friend's dog passed away. I'd hmm. use that as an excuse to drown my blues. But um, I guess the, there is some medical validity to it. It does, a chemical process does happen. Um, I'm not a doctor. I can't tell you when or where it is. Um, I know that coming off of it, some people do need uh, a medical doctor's help for the first uh, few days and, and whatever. Um, but I would not put it into the same category as cancer or Alzheimer's. Um, my grandmother passed away from Alzheimer's uh, two years ago. She didn't choose that. I chose to be an addict and an alcoholic. That was my choice. People don't choose to get cancer. And I think that's the big difference. And I know that it infuriates people. As a matter of fact, I saw a comment this morning on, on your post, and somebody made a comment about that. Well, I don't know why people get uh, so, so um, they cry over these people's posts. They didn't choose this where cancer patients, or they, they chose it and cancer patients did it. And uh, I, I, I agree with that, but at a, at a point, too, it, we're not choosing to do it. The alcohol or the drugs is, it, we, we're physically dependent. Um, and unless I get high, unless I drink, my body is, is not right. And I'm experiencing a whole lot of uh, symptoms because of it. You know, though, you know, the, the people I find the most, I, I, I find them to be extremely honest and they, they place blame on nobody except for them is they don't blame anybody around them they blame it right on themselves are the recovering addicts who I've had on my show and sometimes it's the people around them that try to make excuses for them you know as in when they're uh, uh, but with them they've been, I've had if you've watched any of my shows where I've had people who one person's been in recovery for 10 years they're bluntly honest uh, and that you know they look back at their lives and uh, you know they they just can't believe where they've been and but you know here the thing is is they also don't know where life is even though 10 years out you know they they have to take it one step at a time how how did you finally what you know you went to teen challenge but what finally struck you where you said no more um so we went to a we went to a church service, and I'll never forget the, the preacher preached on you must decide your moment of surrender to God. And and it it struck me like nothing else has ever struck me, um, and I knew that this thing was bigger than myself, and I had tried everything that I could think of to to beat it. And nothing worked, and I knew if I was going to do this, it was going to be with the help of, of God because he was greater than I was, and this disease or this this addiction was bigger than I was. And, and so that was that was my breaking point, was was surrendering to God and saying, all right, you've got to deal with this because I can't. And did you ever have, like, you've been clean for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Is there... Is there any part of you that ever just starts drifting in the wrong direction and you have to pull yourself back? It would be my mind, um, absolutely, absolutely. Um, there, there's days when, you know, and it's one of the things that, that we teach in Team Challenge that, that you have to learn to, to be able to go back to God when it gets to be too much, when the wife is nagging. She does, mine doesn't. <laughs> She's watching. <laughs> when the wife is nagging and, and the kids are complaining and the bills are piling up and work is calling and, and life is happening and it's like, man, it's so hot out today, a beer would be nice. 
you got to play the tape the full way, and I and I have to remember where that beer is going to take me, mm -hmm. and then it's it's not going to be much, you know, it's not going to be very long before I'm back in a, in a shooting gallery or in a crack house or a motel or something stupid, yeah. and and so mm -hmm. you, you gotta you gotta snip it in the butt just say no, I'm not even going there. It's, I'm gonna go mow the lawn. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make you back happy. So, but you know, as I said, the recovering addicts have also told me that they then have to deal with they ha they had to deal with their past. They sure. had to deal with what they did yeah. when they were addicts. How did you know? How did the two of you compart? You know, whether you want to call it compartmentalize or not. How how did, you know? How did you finally put? If if you if you struggled, you you mentioned you had problems with your father. How did you finally were you able to put that to rest? Well, um, uh, let me let me see if I can condense this. Um, uh, with the issue with my father was this thing called forgiveness, you know, and uh, it was going through the process of taking my inventory and, and trying to understand that, that I realized that, you know, I needed to forgive him. And uh, I wrote him a letter and uh, asking for forgiveness and letting him know that I had forgiven him. Now, I didn't get a reply to the letter. My dad was a, you know, lieutenant commander in the Navy and he was World War II, you know, he, he didn't do those kinds of things. Uh, but I didn't do it for a reaction from him. I did it because it was the right thing to do. And later on, my dad and I became the best of friends. Um, but Scott, I, I keep what it was like very green. I keep what it was like like if, like if it happened yesterday. And so when I compare my life, my, my worst day today, is nothing compared to my best day when I was out there using. And so that keeps things in, in check. But, but I attend three to four 12-step meetings every week. Mm -hmm. So I'm hanging out with my friends that understand me. And when my thinking gets squirrely, see, it's a thinking problem now. Mm -hmm. It's how I think. You know, if, it's, if, it's, if there's one thing that I can't afford to entertain, as an addict alcoholic is this thing called resentment. See, so if, I, if that starts to creep into my life, I have people that I'm accountable to that know, you know, or that I can talk with. So not only did I stop, but I need help to stay stopped. And you know, I know a lot of people on the outside world, they think, you know, minute, you know, how stressful can your job be? You work an hour and a half a week. <laughs> you know, you know, uh, but there are people who, but I have friends who are ministers. Yeah. There are people who think ministers, you know, they get up there, you know, they wake up in bed Sunday morning and say, oh, look, today's the day to work. And you get up there. But in reality, you have a very stressful job. Not only are you carrying your own burdens, but you have a lot of flawed people who you're dealing with. And if you probably even have to be careful that you do not take those on too much yeah. because yeah. you know, yeah, I, I've surrounded myself with some good friends, good people that, that help me, you know. I can't do this alone. I can't do anything alone. I need help. Okay, we have about 15 minutes left, but now the question lies is, what is going wrong then? Why, why are we suddenly seeing, you know, seeing all this heroin use? Why are we, it seems to me, you know, like... I was born and raised here, so I don't, uh, even though I travel a lot, and people who move here says, you guys drink a lot of alcohol, and you know, I don't know any different, you know, I, and I, you know, I'm, I, I do have a couple now and then, I, I don't deny it, but I've never had a drinking problem, but people tell me who move here, they say, you drink a lot of beer. Uh, now, are, are, you're you're the only one not from here. Are you, uh, you 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 weren't from this area originally. No, no, no. 
Uh, but you were from yeah, but you were from Vermont. I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. Okay. Do we drink a lot? Moved to Vermont. Vermont per capita is the highest. Yeah, and and one of the highest alcohol consuming. So does that does that make sense then that if we're if we're very high in alcohol, is there a connection between alcohol and then the progression? Cause everybody likes to talk about marijuana as being the gateway drug. If there's such a thing, gateway drug, I would think it'd be alcohol, but that's only my opinion. So where are we going wrong? And what do we need to do to resolve this? Because I think you can keep taking out dealers all we want, but isn't there a greater issue? Anybody, got any answers here? <laughs> We must be doing something wrong. If I had the answer, I would be a millionaire. I would have already uh, solved the world's problems. I mean, I don't know if there's a this is clear this is answer. a very difficult thing because you know, as I've heard uh, said, that when you're using and you want to do it on your own and whatever, you you're just denying the fact that you need help, and it it tells you. See, when I was when I was drinking, you know, I figured I really believed this that that was my lot in life. You know, yeah. I was Irish, and Irish people are supposed to drink and, and, and be drunkards. I really believe that. And, and I had what is known as compound ignorance. I didn't know that I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have a clue. I, I really didn't have a clue. I thought that this was my lot in life. And if the moonshine don't kill me, I'll live till I die. You know, that was my philosophy. And it wasn't until I got desperate enough. And... The truth of the matter is, Scott, that no one will ask for help until they get desperate. Mm -hmm. And until you get sick and tired of being sick and tired of the way that you're living, you aren't gonna, you aren't gonna want change. But do we need to change like something in our community yeah. to make people not want? Are you, Nancy, what do you think? We do, we do. Um, there is a, so much judgment that surrounds um, this, this this topic, mm -hmm. that that is a lot of what Jeanette and I want to change, as well as trying to get into the schools and educate our young, for, and educate and prevent, um, to have this open discussion, age appropriate, but to know that it's okay to talk about it, and it's okay to not judge. It's okay to wrap your hands around these people and love them yes. and be there for them. We as a community need to come together and mm -hmm. help these help these people that want to be helped, that get desperate enough yeah. and reach that mindset that I'm done with this. And that's one of the things that Jeanette are, and I are hoping to do. And um, uh, next week, actually, we are having a community forum you know, uh, the one thing, see, I, I've learned so much from uh, people, you know, such as you, but I, I even have people now come up to me in the store, and I had, I had a couple come up to me and say, hey, I want to thank you for uh, having these people on your show. It helps, gives me hope, and they both said, we're heroin users, and uh, it, it's really created a, it, you know, I don't take credit. I'm just saying. I just I'm just serving as a forum. But I do think because of people like you coming out of the woodwork, at least people are not suffering silently, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. alone. Because you know, uh, I, I don't know how many people just have people come out and just say. Because you guys must now have people like uh, I know. I know you know somebody in my life that has uh, struggled, and you mm -hmm. immediately went to them. Uh, and um, you must have you probably have you probably have people go to you now you probably do too I do and I don't have all the answers but I knew that I do know now there is help out there and that is what we want to accomplish is to yeah. is to let people know one don't be afraid um, to admit it and two let me give you the people who can help you um, because we really want to save uh, lives and we want to you know mention something very important that they're not criminals. Right. right. They're sick people that need, they're broken, sick people that need need to be loved. And Because, I mean, once you start doing that, the guilt and the shame is so, so deep that 
Yeah, that's it's so right. painful that you just say, what's the use? You know, yeah. there's no hope for me. What's the use? Eric would say, um, you and Mom are the ones that keep me going. You're the reason that I'm still here. And I think one of the things that's challenging for people that come out of a rehab center or anywhere really is when they are in recovery, they don't have a support system. And I mm -hmm. think, I'm, I don't have any clinical background, but I think we need to try to develop that, develop that support system like the 12-step program has. Um, my uncle runs the NA. Um, they need that. They need to be able to pick up the phone and say, I need you at 3 a.m. in the morning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And right. they don't always have that because they're embarrassed. Yeah. Right. And there's no reason to be embarrassed. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, from the people I've spoken to, they all say the same thing, and or the parents do, is what you see is as they're starting to go into addiction, they're starting to experiment their lifelong friends start to like, start to distance themselves. And then what happens is that void is filled with those people, you know, other addicts, and instantly, once you go into recovery, those friends, poof. They're gone. Yep. And so mm -hmm. that void is not filled because, you know, for right or wrong, those, your lifelong friends have been, who've been with you, they, they might come back, but it takes a while. But for a while, they all talk about, you're there, you, you're, you don't have anybody. And they, every one of the uh, addicts I've spoken to have said, you quickly find out your life when you're an addict those friends are not your real friends did, yeah. did, did your brother find that did your uh, son find that as well I I even said that to him one day you know where are all your old friends I don't see them coming around anymore and he goes oh well you know I used to be I used to be a drunk I'm not a drunk anymore well he wasn't drinking anymore and he didn't need to um, but that was an excuse I feel um, but for sure, he had lost his close friends. There were a couple that were still coming around once in a while, but uh, mostly it was all new friends. Right. No, I hear that. You know, From the, the addict's point of view, okay. though, I didn't want to be around the, no. the squares. They're, they're, you know, off studying and preparing for college. How boring is that? <laughs> you know? <laughs> look, look at where they're at now. <laughs> uh, so... It's, you know, we can play it off like they were distancing themselves, but the fact is, is that I was choosing to be in other places and doing other mm -hmm. things and doing things that they didn't want to be around. <laughs> and now that I'm clean, some of my friends who are, I don't want to be around the guys who are shooting dope. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be around the bar rooms. Mm -hmm. so, so we do have to distance ourselves. Yeah. And I think that you, you were asking about, well, you know, what's going on in this area and what can we do? Yeah. How can we help? One of the things is, is prevention. I did. We've been going into schools. I've been going into schools for a long time and speaking. I deal with a lot of prevention coordinators. Their budgets are being cut a lot. Mm -hmm. Why are we cutting prevention so that we can put it back into into abuse? Let's, you know, I, I think that's backwards thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, I really think that we need to start pushing the prevention and maybe, you know, I'm not a political guy, but come November we need to start putting people in who are going to back prevention. Um, and <laughs> probably going to step on some toes, but let's not legalize marijuana. Um, it's decriminalized in this state, and I don't think that we need to go any further with it. Uh, but quite simply, it's big business, and if you walk down the mall in Burlington or even stores in, in this city, um, you can find shirts that have drug references that are coming from the big businesses you can find drug paraphernalia and it's these people who are pushing the legislators to legalize marijuana and and saying that it's going to to tax and and bring in revenue and all of that stuff but in reality it's these businesses that want to buy the business of our future generation they're the ones who are targeting my kids so that they think that smoking marijuana is cool and they get started on that, and next thing you know, 20 years later, they're on 
TV saying how they overcame addiction if they're lucky. And how do I explain to my six and nine year old that drugs are bad when marijuana and alcohol are drugs? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You guys, I think people do, you know, I think sometimes people forget alcohol is a drug as well. And um, because, you know, that's the thing is you talk to anybody in the ER, the doctors and that, and they'll tell you, I can't remember what percentage of the ER visits, it's astronomical that is somehow alcohol related. It's, it's a large, all right, we're just about done, but I, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think what we ought to try doing is doing this periodically, uh, you know, as, as time goes on, because I think you guys are great for doing this. Because uh, I do think, you know, good dialogue is a, is a great thing. Uh, okay, um, let's do 30 seconds each, uh, just final words. Pastor Wall. Well, this has been good, and, and uh, uh, as Missy was talking, that the word needs to get out and for people to realize that there is help, we care, and uh, you don't have to be hopeless. You can be hopeful mm -hmm. and be not afraid to get the help that you need. Mm -hmm. yes. I once was a hopeless dope fiend, and, and now I'm a dopeless hope fiend. And if, so, <laughs> if somebody wants, <laughs> wants that... 802-635-7807, they can call Teen Challenge. 802-323-4440, that's my personal cell phone. If you need help, I'm here, I can talk. And, and if Teen Challenge isn't your gig, I know some people who are willing to help out. Okay, you said you're can, I say, yep. can I say 323-3639? Come on. 323-3639, call anytime. <laughs> okay, you be clean. I, just, I've got to ask you this. You're, you're the homeboy. You've been... Uh, you've been you're an addict uh, recovering. Um, if you if you had you look back twelve years ago and said you were going to be sitting right here, what would you say? I want whatever you're on because that's some good stuff. So there's hope. There is hope. Right. Okay, Missy. Mm -hmm. Um, I just want people to know not to give up on themselves. I want family not to give up on their loved ones. Mm -hmm. I want people to take down these numbers. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> um. My brother would not want this for any of them. He would want to see this change. He would want to see um, us going into the schools like Jeanette and I are doing and teaching our young. And I'm, there's hope. There is hope. Yeah. And I agree. We are going into the schools and we're going to prevent a number of people from ever beginning to get to this point. Uh, Gary would surely want to um, continue to be having fun um, here on Earth, but I want to let people know that I'm available also. If they need to call me, I will go with them um, to get help as well. Yeah, that, uh, as I said, particularly with you two having lo lost loved ones, but really in you losing a child, I have three children. I think it's it must be, it's every parent's worst nightmare, which I'm sure all you as parents will agree. Uh, but I, I also think it's great that you're trying, and a lot of parents who lose their kids, especially tragically, they, they kind of they, they try to work make the world a better place, like you are doing. And I that's my hope. Yeah, and uh, I I really commend I, I commend both of you, and I commend all of you for sitting here, because you know, there's a lot of people, they, they choose to sit by, sitting back there, uh, behind their keyboards, I call them keyboard cowards. They sit there and they cast stones. And you know, you might not agree with every, you know, everything you read, but you know, these are just people who sit there all day long in their, I'd say in their mother's basements, and they know everything. <laughs> and they, they cast stones all day long. Well, I don't cast stones because there's enough stones coming back at me. So, uh, thank you again for coming on. But I think we ought to—I think we ought to do it periodically if you're interested, because I—I uh, I think the dialogue is really—I think it's really starting to pay off. So, thank you, for, uh, thank you all for coming on. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Scott. And thank you to the viewers for tuning in to another segment of the Northeast Kingdom Voice.